Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. I'm with you on page 569. We've just finished looking at the Alan Axelrod text, Nothing to Fear, Lessons in Leadership from FDR. And now we'll turn to the radio address on drought conditions. Now let me say two things about this one before we start. One, you can go to YouTube and you can actually listen to the radio address of this speech. It's about a 25 minute address on the radio, okay? What are, number two, what are drought conditions? Let's explain that really quickly. When he gives this speech, September the 6th, 1936, America in the middle of the country is going through a terrible dust bowl drought conditions, okay, terrible. For those of you who will um, study in your junior year with me, you will be reading a text called Grapes of Wrath by the great John Steinbeck, where he will outline just how terrible this experience was. Fundamental to all of this, two things. Write it down. No rain for prolonged periods of time, and therefore nothing can grow, which means that people are losing their livelihood. Now let's start on page 569 up at the top. The speech and the features of the speech. This is a text spoken aloud to an audience. Remarks that communicate an important message. Language intended to engage listeners and support the speaker's ideas. Right away, let's now turn to the speech and we'll read and we'll annotate as we go. Again, FDR speaking. I have been on a journey of husbandry. Husbandry meaning growing stuff. I went primarily to see at first hand conditions in the drought states, to see how effectively federal and local authorities are taking care of pressing problems of relief, and also how they are to work together to defend the people of this country against the effects of future droughts. And then he says it, I saw drought devastation in nine states. By the way, the sidebar tells you that Roosevelt repeats the word I to emphasize his personal experience. We want to write that down. I talked with families who had lost their wheat crop, lost their corn crop, lost their livestock, lost the, notice the repetition of the word lost here, lost the water in their well, lost their garden and come through to the end of the summer without one dollar of cash resources, facing a winter without feed or food, facing a planting season without seed to put in the ground. That was the extreme case. But there are thousands and thousands of families on western farms who share the same difficulties. Let's pause for a moment, put it in our notes. He says two things. One, like Odysseus, I went on a journey. Only this journey took me to the middle of America, nine states, where I saw unbelievable deprivation. Two, he lists that deprivation. People who worked all year and had one dollar total to show for all that work. Because again, the drought conditions. Now, inevitably, you'll ask, what is his rhetorical purpose? Go ahead and jot down. Why do you think at the very beginning he's saying, I went to these nine states and I saw some really terrible stuff? And why would he be saying it in a famous radio address? Well, obviously, he's going to begin to suggest, how can we solve this problem when we have no rain, when we have these drought conditions? Like, what are we going to do? Let's keep working. I saw cattlemen who because of lack of grass or lack of, wind, uh, uh, or lack of wind or feed have been compelled to sell all but their breeding stock and will need help to carry even these through the coming winter. I saw livestock kept alive only because water had been brought to them long distances in tank cars. I saw other farm families who have not lost everything but who because they have made only partial crops must have some form of help if they are to continue farming next spring. And notice your sidebar says Roosevelt gives examples of the hardships he saw to support the argument he's about to make. What can you predict, as good readers, what can you predict is going to be his future argument? Obviously it is H-E-L-P, right? In other words, he's going to argue things are really bad, people need help. I shall never forget, let's keep reading, the fields of wheat so blasted by heat that they cannot be harvested. I shall never forget field after field of corn stunted, earless, and stripped of leaves. For what the sun left the grasshoppers took, I saw brown pastures which would not keep a cow on 50 acres. Yet, 
I would not have you think for a single minute that there is permanent disaster in these drought regions or that the picture I saw meant depopulating these areas. In other words, he says it this way. It's bad, but it's not the end of the world. Let's write that down. He says it's bad, but it's not the end of the world. Okay? No cracked earth, no blistering sun, no burning wind, no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable American farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspire us with their self-reliance, their tenacity, and their courage. And that obviously is the thesis to begin with, right? In other words, America is greater than these kinds of problems. It was their father's task to make homes. It is their task to keep those homes. It is our task to help them with their fight. Now, notice two things. The repetition of the word task, and notice that he uses the word fight, just like in his inaugural address. We are at war, and the army of Americans can solve this problem, right? Next paragraph. Last paragraph on 569. First, let me talk for a minute about this autumn and the coming winter. We have the option, in the case of families who need actual subsistence, of putting them on the dole or putting them to work. They do not want to go on the dole. In other words, just a financial handout. And they are 1,000% right. We agree, therefore, that we must put them to work for a decent wage. And when we reach that decision, top of 570, we kill two birds with one stone because these families will earn enough by working, not only to subsist themselves, but to buy food for their stock and seed for their years planting. Into this scheme of things, there fit, of course, the government lending agencies, which next year, as in the past, will help with production loans. Every governor with whom I've talked is in full accord with this program of doing work for these farm families, just as every governor agrees that the individual states will take care of their unemployables, but that the cost of employing those who are not, who are entirely able and willing to work must be borne by the federal government. In other words, let's pause for a moment, put our notes. He says, work is the solution, not a handout, not a handout. Work is the solution. If they work, they are willing to feel deserving. And it all comes back to, FDR, for FDR, it comes back to respect, right? People will respect themselves and other people will respect these farmers if they are allowed to work for a fair wage. Spending like this is not waste. He's already referencing the potential antagonistic or acrimonious audience who will say, we don't have any money to give to these farmers. Spending like this is not waste. It will spell future waste if we do not spend for such things now. These emergency work projects provide money to buy food and clothing for the winter. They keep the livestock on the farm. They provide seed for a new crop. And best of all, they will conserve soil and water in the future in, these, in those areas most frequently hit by drought. If, for example, in some local area the water table continues to drop and the topsoil to blow away, the land values will disappear with the water and the soil. People on the farms will drift into the nearby cities. The cities will have no farm trade and the workers in the city factories and stores will have no jobs. By the way, notice what he's saying. If we don't do something now, we're going to have ripple effect here. And it's only going to be economic destruction for those in the city. Why is that a big deal? Because it's possible that people in the city might look at these kinds of economic drought conditions and say, it's not our problem. Those people choose to live out on the farm. Let them deal with their own issues. FDR says, no, no, you don't understand. Once their farms fold, where will they be moving to? Well, they got to come to the city. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have serious problems in the city with unemployment and the like, right? Keep reading. Property values in the cities will decline. If, on the other hand, the farms within that area remain as farms with better water supply and no erosion, the farm population will stay on the land and prosper, and nearby cities will prosper too. Property values will increase instead of disappearing. That is why it is worth our while as a nation to spend money in order to save money. Let's write that down. You have to, he says, as a nation, we have to spend money to save money. It is in all of our interest, economically in other words, to help these farmers out who have no way to be able to survive right now because of the drought conditions. Finally, to finish, the very existence of the men and women working in the clothing factories of New York, making clothes worn by farmers and their families, of the workers in the steel mills in Pittsburgh, in the automobile factories of Detroit, and in the harvester factories of Illinois depend upon the farmer's ability 
to purchase the commodities they produce. In the same way, it is the purchasing power of the workers in these factories and the cities that enables them and their wives and children to eat more beef, more pork, more wheat, more corn, more fruit, obviously the repetition of the word more, right? And more dairy products and to buy more clothing made from cotton, wool, and leather. In a physical and a property sense, as well as in a spiritual sense, we are members one of another. Uh, by the way, note the sidebar, the word spiritual, hope, and future appeal to the audience's emotions. We are going, final line, we are going to have a farm policy that will serve the national welfare. That is our hope for the future. And then you even have a picture there on 570. Before the age of TV, before the age of the internet, that was entertainment. You sat around a, a radio and you listened to the President of the United States talk about what it is we're going to do. All right, let's finish now at level 2A, messages, themes. Obviously here we have two major themes. One. The drought conditions are really bad. For someone living in the city who has no idea, he or she might live in the city their whole life and have no sense whatsoever of really how bad the drought conditions are. So notice we're working from a trust factor. When the president says, trust me, two things. I've been there, I've seen it, and it's really bad and we've got to do something about it. Right? Number two. Not only does he say we've got a serious problem, it is our problem. Not their problem. Let's write that down. That's a huge message. The idea is our problem, not their problem. In other words, we're all in this together. Even though it might not seem that way, we're all in this together. We have to help each other out. At 2B, what is a rhetorical focus here? Well, obviously we're working with a very declared thesis. He uses personal experience. He says, I have seen this and I'm telling you, we got to do something to help these people out. And then finally, the argument will be, we are all in this together, which is a powerful metaphor. Hey, hey, notice this. This is not the army metaphor of his inaugural address. This is rather a family metaphor. We're all kind of in this like one big family together. It's a powerful word picture. Finally, at 3A, let's ask this question. What is for you the text, song, movie, that suggests that as a country, when bad things happen, we're all in it together? You can't point at some one group and say, the problem in our country is that group. It, it's their fault that we're having all of these problems. Notice what FDR argues. No, no, we're all in this together. And even though these farmers appear to be them, they are actually us. What are you talking about? They're not us. I live in the city. I could care less. Well, yeah, but you do eat. Where does all that food come from? From the farmers who are, of course, growing that stuff. If you're in the city, for example, working in a factory and you make clothes, those farmers can't afford to buy your stuff if they don't have any money, right? Uh, a second question at 3A, what is for you the greatest text that says work is necessary? What is that for you? For example, think about the text we started with at the beginning of our time together in Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Let us then be up and working. Right? With a heart for anything. Still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. That notion that work is fundamental to what it means to be an American. Why? Not for the money, but for their self-respect and the communal respect. Right? Notice he says it. These farmers don't want a handout. Dole, D-O-L-E is his word. They don't want to just be given something. They want to prove that they are worth the respect of all of us sharing in their difficult time. So it's a compelling argument. Finally, at 3B, a question. Do you believe in this notion that we're all in this together? When you're a senior, we will study the famous English writer John Donne. And in a famous Meditation 17, he says that he, we're all a part of the same island. That whenever a little bit of the island falls off, all of us should somehow be responsible for that. We're all interconnected. Do you believe that? Do you feel like at Royal High School, for example, we're all interconnected? And for example, even though you're a freshman, you're somehow connected with those sixth graders across the meadow. Do you believe that idea that somehow we're all connected? Do you think that you have a responsibility to other people in your country, even though you don't know them? Okay, jot down your views on that one as well. Uh, finally, how do you see these two texts working together? Both of them, of course, are going to comment on the power of the language, 
to change people's opinions about the things that they're most afraid of. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way, both of these texts suggest the importance of having confidence, right? And believing, no matter how bad it is, we can always somehow find a way to get out, right? Find a way to make it. Well, there you go, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, texts on page 571. We've even got a timed writing there. Look at it with me now. Write a brief essay in which you critique Alan Axelrod's interpretation of Roosevelt's first inaugural address. Analyze the historical research study and decide whether you think Axelrod's points are valid and then support your opinion with examples from the text. It's possible you'll be asked to write on this topic. You may want to think about how you would outline something like that. Thank you very much.